So what I wanted to do is to wrap up was to come back to really where, where Ruth started. And I was quoting Alistair Darling's speech, he said that we have the fastest deficit reduction plan of any G7 country. And I think that this graph points out the first flaw in that particular analysis, which is we may have the fastest reduction plan in any G7 country, we also have by far the biggest deficit. So what we've essentially got is we've got, you know, the Weight Watchers most improved. Badge, but we're still going to be extremely overweight. Uh, so that's the first problem with that particular quote we have from Alistair Darling. But the bigger problem is the term deficit reduction plan. Because he's predicted that he will reduce the deficit, and he's outlined that he hopes to reduce the deficit. He had, in fact, insisted that legally he must cut the deficit. But that's not really a plan to do it. It's not really any idea of what they're going to do which will get you there, short of the efficiency you publish, which Williams talked about already. Uh, and that's despite all of those the downside risks, which, again, Mike and Ruth have covered and, and Corinne's talked about, to, to that projection. Uh, so, We've got here not really a deficit reduction plan, and not really a particularly fast deficit reduction plan, were it a plan. What we've had is, as many predicted, putting the issue off till the next election. Now, we all predicted, we're not surprised, but perhaps we should be, find it a little odd that the serious fiscal debates, the budget has no part in. The budget is just irrelevant to the serious fiscal debate going on in the country. For the major government financial statement of the year, that's quite an achievement to be utterly irrelevant to any serious discussion of what's done about the nation's finances. So the best we had in terms of, a spending, of, a, of an actual spending cut in the budget was a uh, housing benefit. They were going to take some steps to address the important issue of some people getting extremely high payments on the housing benefits because of the way the tables work and with some very high value properties in it leads to a lot of scandals that you'll see in the newspapers and you'll see taxpayers and lines comments on. And it is a scandal, and it does need something to be done about it. But the idea is a serious part of addressing the deficit or paying for spending. They don't think it's, they can't project it to save anything within their forecast cost period. They think that in steady state, which is economics code for at some point, maybe, it will save 50 million. That's the kind of spending that we're talking about. Now, a good few months ago, us at the TPA and the Institute of Directors were talking about 50 billion in two years. They're talking about 50 million sometime. So that's this kind of difference between a serious sense of grapple with what's going on in this issue and what we had at the budget. So what I'm going to move on to now, and this is where what I think perhaps is, if you want to find out about the fiscal situation, put down the budget, because it's not going to tell you much, and instead pick up this, uh, which is our book about how to cut public spending. And what, what's in there for it? What is in there which, which you can really learn from going with? A lot that I'm not going to be able to go into now, but I want to talk about a few of the areas that we are we do address in here. We talk about where are the parties now. Could be that we, we'd have got in trouble because we released the book shortly, we, we, get, we get the book ready shortly before the budget, the budget comes out, and oh, all the, all the parties' plans have changed. Fortunately, we heard nothing, and therefore the book is still bang up to date. Uh, so, uh, bang up to date analysis of where the parties are now on the fiscal crisis. We then have what can we cut? An update by Ben Ferrugian, who's here today, uh, who was the TPA's deputy research director, looking at. Uh, Updating that analysis we did with the IOD, bringing all of the data right up to now, setting out an ambitious set of cuts, including lots of organisations. And this is a thing which Sir Richard Packer, who's also here today, talks about in his chapter of the book, because where he deals with how can you best bring along the white bond the civil service who you need to make this and make any program spending cuts happen. One of the things he really identifies is that it's really important not just to have these big across, what, what, what the Scandinavians, and we have a chapter from, from a Swedish author in this book about what happened in Sweden, not just the cheese slicer cuts, as they call it, which take a bit off everyone, things like a pay freeze, which take a bit out of everyone's uh, budgets, but also cake slicer, as they call it, surgical cuts, saying we're going to take out this budget line. And that's really important for a number of reasons. I won't go into all of them, but one reason, for example, one, one quite simple reason is, if you take 10% of the budgets out of every single department, of every single you know, organization, of the, of the th over 1,100 quangos, <coughs> all those quangos still have their head offices. They all have their <coughs> HR departments. They all have their non-executive boards. They all have with, with their expenses. They have, all have 
all of these uh, running costs, you take far more out of them, you actually start cutting out some organisations entirely. And we've got a big list to get the politicians started, finding organisations to axe, from the regional development agencies to the Carbon Trust, to the Standards Board, we're going to start taking out some of these products. Other things we talk about is other policy areas, so things like spending transparency, so we can get more ideas on how to get cuts, we can start to build public appreciation of where all the waste is. Uh, looking at policies like energy policy, can we reasonably expect to push through a mass of fiscal adjustments, which, however, it is going to be painful, can we expect to do that at the same time as doubling energy prices? due to uh, climate change targets, looking at that kind of broader policy agenda. And the, the biggest policy agenda we focus on in that area is fiscal decentralisation, which might sound like one of these luxuries to deal with in sunny times, but that thing of, of giving local authorities great responsibility to their own finances. Mike's looks at it and found that if you look at the international evidence on this, you can be looking at saving up to £70 billion because you have more responsive and more better adapted local services. Uh, we look at what, how we can bring in the private sector to push forward cuts. Uh, William Lawson has a chapter about the James Review and, the, uh, and, and how it brought private sector expertise in to look for cuts. And Dave Williams from over in the States, who uh, predicted can't be here, we couldn't bring him out, uh, talks from Citizens Against Government Waste, talks about the Grace Commission, set up under President Reagan, told to be tireless bloodhounds and go and unearth potential savings. Uh, and then we're also... We, uh, we're also looking at other countries. Can this be young? We want to start looking first at what's happened in other countries. We've got a chapter, an extensive analysis of what happened in Sweden and the lessons from other countries there. We've also got what happened in Canada. Now, you, you'll have heard the story about Canada quite a lot. And current history of the conventional story of Canada, which is to look at the federal level, which is very important because the federal level is, you know, it's, it, that's the big government. But Canada's the most decentralised uh, state there is in the developed world. It's a, very, a lot of the work gets done in the provinces when they do anything. In their, in, in their provinces. Now, in the provinces, the picture wasn't quite the uh, liberal government gets elected, is forced to cut spending by the markets, and kind of does it by palming the work <coughs> off on the provinces, which is roughly the sort of institute of government story of what happened in Canada. In the provinces, robust governments get elected, promising they'll deliver low spending, low tax, low debt. They deliver, they face down process. One of them says, my day isn't complete without a process for two or three. But they bring the public with them and they enjoy robust public support because they set out a concrete program and they deliver it. And so really think, if you're looking for budget, and one of the important issues here is that we need to show that, we have, that we're serious about cutting spending as a country. Moody's have said that British public opinion appears to be relatively receptive to the need for cuts. And that's one of the reasons our credit raising hasn't come down. So all these, all these signals that Britain might be willing to cut spending matter, and I can't think of a better signal that Britain's serious about getting its public deficit under control than high sales for a book about how to cut public spending. <laughs> so <laughs> please up here to Britain and you know, pick up a copy of that book. And, uh, thank, thank you for being here. We'll now open it up to questions.